Please take the Word of God this morning and turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts in chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. We have been uh, spending some time in Acts chapter 7. Uh, it's a significant chapter, I believe, for the church history because this sermon by Stephen uh, resulted in the first martyr of the church. Uh, Stephen, by the end of this sermon, is going to lose his life. And as we come here to chapter 7, we know that Stephen stands before the Sanhedrin council made up of Pharisees and Sadducees and the high priest during that time. And Stephen has been accused by false witnesses of speaking blasphemous words against God, against Moses, against the temple, uh, and against the law. And the question is asked in Acts chapter 7, verse 1, Then said the high priest, Are these things so? And we have been looking really at this sermon and considering a number of things, and we've seen that uh, this sermon is about God. <laughs> he begins the sermon by saying, The God of glory. And we see that he ends this sermon with God before he confronts them for resisting the Holy Ghost. And he's going to go through this sermon as we have seen and read. He's going to go through a history of the nation of Israel. And he highlights three individuals that we have seen that are prominent to Israel's history. The first one is Abraham. If you would, the first patriarch for the nation of Israel. And then he goes, he's going to go on to briefly mention in verse 8, Isaac and Jacob. And then uh, it's going to be Joseph from verse 9 down to verse 19. And then finally, he's going to talk about Moses from verse 20 all the way to verse 44. And he's going to end with a brief mention of David the king and of Solomon and a mention of the temple and how God cannot be contained, uh, nor does he dwell in the temple alone. He is much greater than the temple that was built by King Solomon. And Solomon acknowledged that, that not only the temple could not contain God, but that the heaven of heavens could not contain God. But as we look at this message here from Stephen, and we've looked at it in a number of ways, last week we considered that the pattern that, St that, uh, that uh, Stephen highlights throughout this sermon is the the hardness of the heart of the children of Israel. And there's been a pattern throughout their history that they've rejected time and again. God's messengers, God's deliverer, as in Joseph, as in Moses, because of the hardness of their heart. And Stephen basically says, nothing has changed, can't you see? But I'm concerned as we look at this message, and I, I ask this question. Why would Stephen go through all the pains of explaining the history of the nation of Israel. Why does he go through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and then Moses and God leading the children out of Egyptian bondage to go into the promised land all the way to when the temple was built under the reign of King Solomon? And I would submit to you is because the history of Israel is very important for us. Not just for the nation of Israel. As we think about the Jews, the Pharisees, the scribes during that day, those who are part of the Sanhedrin Council, typically the Jews of that day prided themselves in a number of things, but let me mention at least three of things that they prided themselves in. The first one was the land that they were in. They prided themselves because it was God that gave them that land. They looked at the Jews that were part of the diaspora that were scattered around the world. They, they were really... Uh, and mad and upset at them and hated them because they wouldn't come back to the land. The Jews also prided themselves in their, uh, in, if you would, the, the patriarchs and their fathers. That's why they would mention to Jesus Christ, we are Abraham's children. We are uh, the, uh, we uh, listened to the law of Moses and they held their, their patriarch in high esteem, but also they prided themselves in their covenants. And the covenants that God made with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, reiterated and expanded. Uh, you see in the Davidic covenant later on. And so all those things they prided themselves in. 
And as we read here, I want us to deal with the history of Israel. And what I want to address here is that the reason why Stephen is going through all of the history of Israel is to show them Jesus Christ. Now that's the purpose. And what he is showing them by that history is that they have missed altogether the purpose of Israel's history. What is the purpose of Israel's history? Why do we have the Old Testament? And why, as we look at those first century preachers, as in Peter and Stephen, who are the ones that we've seen preached up to this point, why do they make constant reference to Israel's history? Why do they make constant reference to the covenants? Why do they make constant reference to the patriarchs? Why do they do all, the, all of that? And the answer is very simple. To show the Lord Jesus Christ. In those covenants. In those patriarchs. In those promises. I want us to begin reading here. Notice with me as Stephen is going to answer the question by the high priest posed in verse 1. Are these things so? Those accusation that he is speaking blasphemous words against Moses, against the law, against the temple, against God. Stephen says this, he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken, the God of, our, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Sharan, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Sharan. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. And he gave them none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on, yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. And God spake on this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land, that they should bring them into bondage, and entreat them evil four hundred years. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God. And after that shall they come forth and serve me in this place. And he gave him, that's God gave Abraham, the covenant of circumcision, and to Abraham, and so Abraham begat Isaac, and circumcised him the eighth day, observing the covenant. And Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. I want to bring your attention to verse 8, where the Bible says, He that is God gave him, Abraham, the covenant. I want to preach this morning on the Lord made a covenant. The Lord made a covenant. As we look at um, Acts chapter 7 and Stephen begins his message, he's going to go through Abraham all the way to King Solomon. And he's going to explain all of this history and this is a reminder again as I've pointed out before that the documentation, the facts about Israel's history is really not about Abraham. It's not about Joseph. It's not about Moses. It's not about King David. And it's not about Solomon. It's about God. It's about what God is doing and what God has done. If you notice the language of this portion we met, the Bible says the God of glory appeared to Abraham. And what did he do? The Bible said he spake. Uh, we see in verse 3, he said. In verse 5, he gave him. Verse 5, he to give it to him. Verse 6, and God spake. Verse 7, uh, said God. Verse 8, and he gave him the covenant of circumcision. So this, uh, this history of Israel is not so much about Israel as much as it is about God. And so I want us to consider, because the emphasis here is, from verse 2 to verse 8, is particularly on Abraham, but more specifically on the Lord that gave the covenant to Abraham. And I want us to notice a few things, because what uh, Stephen is doing here, he is talking about, in essence, 
As we think about the history of Israel, what is that all about? I'll tell you what it's all about. It's about the plan of God. Someone has labeled and called this, as you look throughout the Bible, the Old and the New Testament, it is the unfolding drama of redemption. It is the plan of God for the redemption of mankind. That's what the history of Israel is all about. But when we think about Abraham, notice here, before Abraham was, Jesus said, I am. And here, before Abraham even comes on the scene, we go back to Genesis chapter 12 and we know what happened. Stephen reminds them, God appeared to Abraham. It was not the other way around. It was not Abraham appearing unto God. It was God appearing unto Abraham and God setting in motion the plan of redemption. In other words, the plan of redemption is way before Moses steps on the scene. As a, indeed, we can look through the New Testament. Let's look at some New Testament scripture. Let's go to 1 Corinthians in the epistle to the church at Corinth. 1 Corinthians in chapter 2. And notice with me verse uh, 7 here. We're thinking about the plan of redemption, God's plan, worked out throughout the pages of Scripture. And notice with me 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. In other words, the plan of God, the mystery of redemption, what are we talking about? It is that which was before ordained before the world. Well, guess what? That's before Abraham. Indeed, we can look over to Galatians chapter 4. In Galatians chapter 4, Paul mentions the same thing as he writes to those believers in Galatia. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, he says, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. Notice the, the expression here, when the fullness of the time was come, God sent. In other words, it was in the mind and the plan of God, but then the fullness of the time arrived, and then God sent forth His Son. In other words, the plan was set in motion long before that. We could also read in Romans chapter 1, I love this portion of Scripture in Romans 1, as, Ro as uh, Paul begins this epistle to the Romans in verse 1, he says, Paul, the servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separate him to the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning, verse 3, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Notice this Jesus Christ, notice which he had promised afore by the prophets and the Holy Scriptures. You see, it is appropriate for us, it is appropriate for also Stephen and Peter to preach on the history of Israel. And often so, someone may come up and say, well, you know, Pastor, I'm not really concerned with the history of Israel. It's not, uh, it doesn't pertain to me. Oh, you're wrong. It does pertain to you. Because if we and I do not have the history of Israel and what God planned out through that history, then we do not know who Messiah is. And so this history is very important, but understand this history did not begin with Abraham. It began in the mind of God long before Abraham ever came on the scene. I ask us today as Stephen is preaching, and I, I'm trying here to, 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 to look at what Stephen here is seeing as he goes through this history, but ultimately he's presenting the gospel, he's speaking of Christ, but what is the gospel based on? In other words, Stephen is attempting to show the Sanhedrin council that the gospel that he is preaching is not anything new. It's not something that if you would, hey, let me introduce you to someone that you have no idea about, that nobody has ever known would come. No, uh, Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all of the prophecies of the Old Testament. And so the gospel is based upon three things that I'm going to see that Stephen is going to speak at as he deals primarily with Abraham. What is the gospel that we preach based on. First of all, if you want to write it down, the gospel we preach is based upon God's promises. As we see Stephen, he says, The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Sharan. 
And now, what uh, Stephen is going to do, he's going to bring his focus into three different areas, and there are three distinct passages in the Old Testament. First of all, Stephen is going to emphasize the promise that God made about a land. He's going to mention from verse 2 all the way down to verse 5, land. Notice in verse 3, land. Twice in verse 4, he talks about a land. He talks about in verse 5, he gave it. Gave it twice in verse 5 for a possession. Again, in verse 5. And so the land is the emphasis, but then God, uh, Stephen moves in his sermon from the emphasis of the land, the promises that God made concerning the land, and then he moves on to the prophecies of God. And notice, and so the first part of the land really is a, is a, a mention of looking back at Genesis 12. And as he continues to move and he talks about the prophecies, he goes at this time uh, in verse uh, um, 6 and 7, he refers back to Genesis 15. When God, you remember, made his covenant with Abraham. Remember, he, would, he was about to put Abraham to sleep, and he's going to make a covenant with himself. Why? Because Abraham is not sufficient to make a covenant with. So God's going to make a covenant with himself. Abraham is going to stand on the side. He's going to be sleeping. And God is going to make this covenant with Abraham, that in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And in that, in the midst of that, he prophesies to Abraham two sections of Israel's history. He basically says that your seed is going to sojourn into a strange land, and when they go to that land, they're going to be in bondage. That's long before Joseph was on the scene, and long before you had the 12 tribes of Israel, who because of the famine in Canaan, moved to Egypt under the rule of Joseph. And then he says, the second part of this prophecy is that uh, then I'm going to raise a deliverer and they're going to be brought out of that bondage unto the land that I have promised you. So he refers back to Genesis 15. And then he's going to speak of the covenant of circumcision in verse 8, and that's a direct reference to Genesis 17. So as we look here at the beginning of the part of Stephen's sermon, the first part is Genesis 12. The second part is Genesis 15. The third part is Genesis 17. And the first one is God's promises. Let's go back as he talks about the land. Notice verse 3. And said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans, and dwelt in Sharan, and from thence when his father was dead, he removed him unto this land wherein ye now dwell. And he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on, yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. Let's go back to Genesis 12. Now notice here, all Stephen is doing... He is preaching and quoting at the beginning here, Genesis chapter 12. I, uh, we ask here, is Stephen preaching anything new? No. As a matter of fact, you look through the entirety of this sermon, there is not one thing that Stephen said that the Sanhedrin council said, that's not true. Not one thing. Everything he says is true. And so if we go back to Genesis 12, notice verse 1. Now, the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So there's a focus here as we go back to Genesis 12 on the promises of God that he made to Abraham. And here, this promise was about a blessing, a land, and a seed. But notice the seed specifically says that in thee, that means not only in him, but in his seed after him, all the families of the earth would be blessed. So the promises here that Stephen is rem uh, reminding them of is the promises that God made to Abraham that Abraham's blessing would extend to all families of the earth. And so when we read about the land, we think about Abraham, something interesting is mentioned in verse 5 because we think about this land that was promised to Abraham, but yet we all know he never possessed that land. You can read all throughout Genesis, he never possessed that land. So what was the promise about? 
What was it about? Well, as we think about the life of Abraham, there's a good summary of Abraham's life in Hebrews 11. If you turn there with me in the book of Hebrews in chapter 11. In Hebrews 11, notice with me, if you go down and let's look at verse... Obviously, we're talking here about Abraham. Let's look at verse 8 where he begins with Abraham here and he says, By faith, Hebrews eleven eight. Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles, that means like in tents, temporary places, with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. And so we look at that and we say, well, look, God promised him a land, but then he, he basically was a stranger in that land that God promised him. He dwelt in, in tabernacles and tents. In other words, it was temporary. There was never, if you would, a permanent place where God says, here, now you own it. I've given it to you. Here it is. Own it. No, there was a bunch of people living there. As a matter of fact, you remember uh, documented in Genesis chapter 14, 15, and 16 is the war of all the kings there in that area where it's all warring against each other. And so Abraham kind of sits on the sideline and observe all that's going on. It's not his land. But what was Abraham ultimately looking for? Well, Hebrews tells us. Verse 10. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. How could Abraham continue to serve God despite never having seen those promises fulfilled in the literal sense as in owning all of that land? Because that's not what he was looking for. He was looking for a heavenly city, not an earthly one. He was not looking, if you would, for his dwelling to be upon earth. He was looking for a builder and a maker who is God. That's what Abraham was looking for. But you see, the Jews of that day, they had made it all about the land. God it can only work in this land. God can only work in this temple. God can only look by, work by us, His people who have received the covenants and the law and the land. This is all about us. And He says, no, you're wrong. It's not about you. It's about God and what God had said. And let's remind ourselves that Abraham never got that land that you're uh, holding on so dearly to. He never got that land because he wasn't looking for it. He was looking for something much greater. But not only do we see the emphasis on the land as he's talking about them, and he says that Abraham never indeed received the fullness of that land. Verse 6, And God spake on this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land, and that they should bring them into bondage, and entreated them evil four hundred years. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God. And after that shall they come forth and serve me in this place. So first of all, when we think about the gospel that we preach, uh, the gospel we preached is based upon God's promises. And secondly, the gospel we preached here in verse 6 and 7 is based upon God's prophecies. Let's go back to Genesis 15. In uh, Acts 7, verse 6 and 7, Stephen makes a reference back to Genesis chapter 15. Now, what happened in Genesis 15? This is a very significant chapter for us as we consider the history of Israel. Notice with me Genesis 15, and let's begin reading in verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. Is mine heir. And so here, uh, Abraham doesn't know what God is doing. He still doesn't have a son. He still doesn't have the land. And then he says, well, maybe God is working in mysterious ways that I don't know. Maybe my seed is to come through his chief servant, Eliezer of Damascus. He has a son. Maybe, maybe it's through him that the seed will come and the blessing will come. What does God say in verse 4? And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Imagine, he has no son. 
And he's looking at the stars of heaven. He says, so shall thy seed be. And notice verse 6, wonderful verse, quoted in Romans 4. And he, Abraham, believed in the Lord, and he, God, counted it unto him, Abram, for righteousness. The question is, what was Abraham believing in? What was, he, what was it that he was believing in? As God says, uh, the stars on earth, so shall thy seed be. And the Bible says he believed in the Lord, and God counted it that faith for righteousness. That's interesting. In this very chapter, God is going to institute His covenant with Abraham. Uh, notice here, if we keep reading in verse 7, And He said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldeans, to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall, that I shall inherit it? And He said unto him, Take me an heifer a three years old, and a she goat a three years old, and a ram a three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcass, Abraham drove them off. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. Now, what is going on here on this scene is the traditional covenant that a man makes with another man. In other words, at that time, uh, when uh, men would make a pledge or promise to be faithful with a, uh, an agreement or a covenant, uh, they would often uh, grab those animals, and here uh, they are grabbing here, divided the, um, the, the goats, the heifers, the rams, the turtle doves, and the young pigeons. And so what they would do, those larger animals, they would sever them in two, and they would lay one half of the animal on one side, and the other half of the animal on the other side. For the small pigeons, they would not divide them, but they would put, because they were so small, uh, one pigeon on this side, another pigeon on this side. And so uh, then what they, these two men would do, they would say, all right, uh, we're going to walk together in between those animals that have been divided, and this is the agreement that as we walk together uh, between those two, uh, those divided animals, we are agreeing that if we do not keep our word in this covenant, in this agreement, may we be as those animals. That was the covenant, the agreement. But what is interesting here is um, the whole scene is preparing and, and God told Moses to do this. Moses does this and everything is divided and the fowl's coming and, and Abraham is like, all right, well, I gotta, you know, he's shooing all those those birds, the ravens, all that is coming around. And then he, I guess he got tired and he fell asleep. I think God put him asleep. You know what happened? Here is God about to make a covenant with Abraham. And Abraham fell asleep, verse 12. And the Bible says in verse 13, And he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land, that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Now that's what Stephen is referring to in Acts chapter 7. The generations of Abram after him, particularly in Joseph, will be brought into a strange land. We know now it would be Egypt. And that's where the, if you would, the twelve tribes of Israel would develop and multiply for four hundred and thirty years. The second part of that prophecy, verse 14, and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward, that's by the way the ten plagues, and afterward shall they come out with great substance, and indeed they would. And thou shalt go to thy father in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down, and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river of the river Euphrates. And so notice here the scene. The Bible says there's a, this great great light, this great lamp that passes between those pieces. Abraham is asleep. This is the presence of God. God is just making a covenant with Abraham, but he does not depend upon Abraham to fulfill that covenant. Abraham is incapable of fulfilling that covenant. And so God uh, uh, is making a surety of his promise, and he basically makes a covenant with himself. Stephen, why is he talking about all this? Because salvation is not of man. 
Salvation is of God. It is about God making a covenant with man. Not the other way around. Now notice here, that means that there's nothing that Aram can do to nullify that covenant. Why? Because he was not part of the agreement. In the sense that he didn't walk between those pieces. And so we have those prophecies that are mentioned at that moment when the covenant is made with Abraham and God walks between those pieces. He says, your seed is going to be in bondage in a strange land. They're going to be there for 400 years. And then when the time appointed, they will be delivered from that bondage and go to that promised land. That is the promise I've made unto you. It's not based upon you, Abraham. It's based upon what I said. So if we go back to Acts chapter 7, continuing to think about this covenant that God made with Abraham. So we see that God's, the, the, were the, the, the gospel is based upon God's promises. That all families of the earth would be blessed in the seed of Abraham. The gospel is based upon God's prophecies that God would fulfill what he said and the fulfillment of prophecy is the proof that God did what he said he would do. But thirdly, the gospel is based on God's performance of the covenant. Not ours. God's performance of the covenant. And notice verse 8 of Acts chapter 7, and he, after... Stephen refers back to those prophecies on the day that God made the covenant with Abraham concerning the nation of Israel and the descendants. Verse 8, and he gave him the covenant of circumcision. So now we go all the way up to Genesis chapter 17. Let's go there, Genesis chapter 17. So Genesis 12, the covenant of Abraham is about the promises. The gospel is based on the promises of God. Genesis 15 is the prophecies concerning the nation of Israel. The gospel of God is based upon the, pro the fulfilled prophecies of God. But now we come to Genesis 17 and we find here that this covenant of circumcision that is mentioned refers back to Genesis 17 and... Um, We could look at this uh, entire chapter, but let's look particularly and um, let's begin reading in verse 1. And when Abram was 90 years old, by the way, still no child, said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Now remember, what is this covenant about? Back to Genesis 12. That's what he's talking about. And he made that agreement with God in Genesis 15. Verse 5. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. <laughs> Still no children. But God says, I, I, it's already happened. Verse 6, And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. What's the covenant about? Let me just stop right there. It's not about the circumcision. That's not the covenant. The covenant has already been made. The promises of Genesis 12. God saying, I will fulfill those promises in Genesis 15. As I make this covenant with myself, while Abraham is sitting there asleep, and then we come to Genesis 17, the covenant, he called, we, we, we see, he says, the covenant of circumcision, but what is he talking about? He's not talking about the circumcision. 
He's talking about the promises and the prophecies of God. And he says, you're going to remember the covenant that I've made with you by this circumcision. Notice verse 11. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a, here it is, a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. The word here is a token of the covenant. This token would distinguish the Jewish people from all other people. But here is the important question for us. Why did God require all the men in the household to be circumcised? The Bible answers this question. We just read it. It shall be a token of the covenant. So the word token is important. What does the word token mean? It means a, a flag, a beacon, a monument, a sign, or a mark. Another word that is closely related to token is the word evidence. That's what the circumcision is all about. Uh, this was not the first time the word token is used. Remember, the first time it is used in the Bible refers back to when Noah uh, arrived on dry land after uh, the, the great flood that destroyed, that destroyed the world. And then God gave a token to Noah with what? A rainbow. And he says, I will not again destroy the world like this. So the rainbow is a token, a sign, the evidence that God would not do that again. So what, the, what is the circumcision about? It's about the people of God, the nation of Israel, recognizing, going back to, and believing, and proclaiming, and standing for the covenant of God. You see, the circumcision is connected to the promises and the covenant that God made with Abraham. That in him all the families of the earth would be blessed. Another time that the word token is used, you remember, right before the children of Israel were about to go out of the promised uh, to go out from Egypt to the promised land, you remember the last plague is that uh, they had to uh, pour the blood or uh, post the door of uh, the blood of the lamb or the doorposts. So that when the angels passed by, he would see the blood and he would pass over that house. You know what God said? He said, that shall be a token. It would be a sign. It would be a reminder that the people of God did what God said. That he would pass over them if he saw the blood. You see, a token in itself, uh, as we see, is not, if you would, the deed itself. It is not that, that which is important, that which is done, that which is believed in. And so when Abraham, he circumcised all the male child that are part of his household, understand he did that because he believed in the promises of God. As you read throughout the New Testament, it is interesting that the covenant, in other words, notice in verse 8, and he gave him the covenant of circumcision, and so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. So every time they were circumcised, they were a reminder of what? Not the circumcision. It was a reminder of God's covenant with man. As we read, as we come to the New Testament, I want you to see here, because apparently that is what you know, the Jews, as we, they prided themselves in the covenants. We be the people of the covenant of God. And they forgot all about what the covenant was about. What was the covenant about? Well, let's go to Luke chapter 1. We come to the New Testament. Jesus Christ is announced. In Luke chapter 1, we find here what happens. What is happening when Jesus Christ comes on the scene? What is being fulfilled, if you would? And Zacharias here... He was filled with the Holy Ghost in verse 67, and he prophesied saying this in verse 68 and 69. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. For he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the... Uh, to perform the promise to our fathers, and to remember His holy covenant. The horn of salvation is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Zechariah sees that the Lord Jesus Christ comes on the scene, and he says, God has fulfilled His covenant with Israel. 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. God has done it. We've been waiting through it all those years. It's been prophesied. It's been promised. And here it is. This covenant is being fulfilled in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, if you go to Acts chapter 3, amazing truth, Peter here after he healed that lame man, notice what he says in Acts chapter 3. And if you go down to verse 25, the Bible says, Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindred of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. What is the covenant about? What is it that they had failed to remember the promises of God that Messiah would come and He would turn all of them from their iniquities? That's the fulfillment of the covenant. If we go in Romans chapter 9, we read of Paul's great burden for the nation of Israel who had rebelled and rejected the Messiah uh, by an overwhelming majority, although there were many Jews that came to know the Lord. In In Romans 9, Uh, And notice with me in verse uh, 3, Paul says, For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the what? The covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. What was all the covenants about? It was about Christ coming. In thy seed Abraham all nations of the earth would be blessed. I want you to turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. I appreciate you uh, listening here as we're looking at this here. Galatians chapter 3. We're almost done here. Galatians 3. Notice with me. Paul writes at length about Abraham. And notice what he says in Galatians 3 and verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. What's that? Genesis 15. Remember that? Verse 7, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham. What was going on? What was God saying to Abraham? He was preaching the gospel to Abraham. Abraham did not see a son. He could not see those promises. But he believed in those promises, having not seen them. That's faith saying, In thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. And notice here, Paul attaches the gospel being preached unto Abraham to this saying, In thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Verse 9, So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. Uh, it's interesting. I don't have time to go into that. But there's a distinction between the covenant that happened in Genesis 15 and the covenant that happened on Mount Sinai. The, co- the covenant that happened in Genesis 15 is unconditional. It does not depend upon man. The covenant that God made at Sinai it is conditional. If you do this, you're cursed. If you obey me, you're blessed. If you don't, you're cursed. That's conditional. But the covenant that God made in Genesis 15 is unconditional. It is not dependent on man's work. It's dependent upon what God has done. We keep reading in verse 11 of Galatians 3. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident. For the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be, uh, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. You see, you and I, there's nothing we can do to add to God's covenant in Genesis chapter 15, that in these shall all nations of the earth be blessed. That is what God is, has done, not man. Now, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Verse 16, he saith not, 
and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ. So what is Jesus Christ? Who is he? He is the confirmation of God's covenant with Abraham. That's who Jesus Christ is. The law which was 400 years and 30 after. You see, when did the law come in? 400 years later. The law is not part of that covenant. You cannot be redeemed by your works. You are not good enough. Keeping the law is a condition of God. But it does not give you everlasting life. Everlasting life and forgiveness in the Lord Jesus Christ is only based upon the work of God on our behalf. Notice, that law that came in 400 years later cannot disannul that it should make the promises of non-effect. In other words, when the law comes in 400 years and God says, you do this and you don't do this and you have to keep my law. If you keep my law, you are blessed. If you don't keep my law, you are cursed. That's a temporal thing. It has nothing to do with the covenant that was established in Genesis chapter 15 because uh, the, he says the law does not disannul, it does not reject, it does not do away with God's unconditional covenant. And it never will, by the way. So how can we sum up what Stephen is saying when he talks about the covenant of God. Let's go and we'll be done to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 19. Let's all read it together. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Think about those words. God reconciling the world to himself. Not imputing their trespasses. And hath committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation. You see, what is... The covenant all about is about God making a covenant with himself, but ultimately in its full extent, as the plan is worked out, what is it about? It's about God reconciling the world back to himself. You see, the promise was with himself. Salvation is only of God. It's not of man.